Today, I'm with James Wilder. How are network marketers like us supposed to rank advance and build a downline without begging our friends and family or having supermodel good looks? My mind was blown when I realized that the top network marketers aren't calling their friends and families to invite them to lame hotel meetings and in-home meetings. I've spent the last two years learning from and dissecting the system that top earners in the industry use. Follow me on the journey as I continue to learn and implement the top marketing tips and strategies to grow my downline. This is Sarah Peterson and you're listening to MLM Marketing Explosion. He's awesome. He's like that ninja secret weapon in your back pocket that most people will not even know that you have, but he's going to make all the difference between a good business and an awesome, great, amazing business. And um, he does, I'll let you tell, I'll let him tell you a little bit more about what he does, but seriously, he's one of those guys that when you can spend money, go get a good copywriter because um, it's a really overlooked skill, I think. There is such a magic and such a finesse if you want it to done right and if you want it to convert like you want it to. So without further ado, I'm gonna let James give you a little bit of his background. That was a, that was a big hype up there. I don't know if I can follow that. Um, yeah, so I've been copywriting for two years, worked with some pretty big names, worked with financial publishers. Um, e-commerce just kind of all over the map like I haven't really niched down into anything and um, yeah I just do that on a freelance basis most of the work that I've done I, I do work for cheaper than I should and then the client loves it and then pulls me in on a retainer so I just get a retainer all the time which is rare um, but yeah so there's, yeah that's pretty much all there is to it yeah do you want me to go back to like where I got started in this or how I got started or just talk about copywriting or that, you know what, you could give us a smuggersburg, but I'd love to know where you came from because I think a lot of people, um, they don't really know where to start. Right. So they don't start. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I was the king of that. Um, I guess to go back like a little ways and kind of how I got started, like what, what kind of gave me my why was um, I went to Thailand in like 2007 and I fell in love with it. I was there for three months and then um, eight months later, I was like, I got to, the whole time I was like, I got to figure out how to move there. So I went back there and I bought a burger restaurant and lived there for a year, but that was in like 2008, 2009. So the economy, the global economy crashed and tourism crashed along with it. So, um, ties don't really eat burgers. So I had to, you know, my market dried up, so I had to come home. Uh, but I still never lost that desire to live there. And I had a buddy from elementary school on Facebook and, uh, he was always posting about making money online and stuff like that. It was like 2010. And so I reached out to him and just asked him, like, what are you up to? And he was in a company called Carbon Copy Pro. Do you know that company? No. So that was like, a, it was sort of like an MLM sort of thing. It had a, a low tier front end, which was like $99. And then it had a back end of like high ticket, high ticket products that you could sell and make huge commissions off of. But it was more or less an MLM structure. So I jumped into that and had zero success. Um, I just couldn't. I couldn't be the dude that went out and like sold his family or friends or anything like that. Uh, so I did that and then I jumped over to trying to market for local businesses. So I'd call them up and uh, try and sell them services. I couldn't do that either because I had this thing where like I couldn't fake it till I make it sort of thing, right? Um, so I did that and I didn't have any success. And so about six years went by in all that time. Um, and then I finally just hired a mentor. I was like, either I'd I double down now or I just get out. Like, this is just, this is stupid. Um, so I, I uh, joined, I don't know if you know, Lucas Roshevsky, he's a copywriter. So I, I joined his mentorship and um, yeah, from there it was just everything kind of snowballed and went like, like in nine, 10 months, I went full time as a freelancer and that's where I am now. Yeah. That's so awesome. So I got to know, is this something that you had a background in or did you just realize that it was something you were good at? Um, with copywriting, I mean, I guess the thing is like during that six years, I was every day obsessively studying and like every, you know, I was like, I'm just kind of, I was submersed in it because it's so addictive, right? Like even when I failed in the uh, Carbon Copy Pro, I, I didn't stop. I just kept going. I kept reading everything. I, you know, I was on all the email lists and um, I was a major, like I was a major consumer at the time. Right. And I had the shiny object syndrome, so I wasn't getting traction in anything. You know, you jump over here and you jump over there, but no, there was no, I didn't have any experience outside of that. Like I worked front desk of a hotel for years. Like I grew up in it. Uh, my grandparents managed a place since I was six. So I was like, that's all I ever did until two years ago. 
So yeah. Although there are insights in working with thousands and thousands of customers. Cause I mean, with copywriting, all you're doing is you're just plucking into people's fears and desires and wants and put, turning them into a sales message. Right. So probably get lots of value that in your, in the real world, you probably, you're probably more of a copywriter than you think you are. I think people put copywriting on a pedestal, but once you start to really understand it, it's a lot simpler than you think. Copywriters kind of fly under the wheel, so to speak, because they aren't necessarily out there saying, look at me, look at me, look at me. They aren't out there saying, look at me, look at me, look at me. Mm -hmm. So how did you transition from everything you knew? And I think you did have a whole head start because you've been around people, but everybody's around people. That's but what I'm saying. Everybody yeah. has that advantage. Yeah. But totally. how, did, how did you transition that into let me handle your ad or let me do copyright for you? Or how, how did you do that? Yeah. So um, just through willing to be... Um, I don't know. I, I guess I'm trying to think of the first time I did it. First time I did it, um, I got it to take the story. It, it, the problem is a lot of people come to me and they ask like, Oh, how do I do it? And I was like, I, I do not have a system that you can repeat because I just fell through everything. Um, so I posted in a, in a job board group um, offering services and people love the post. It just it sort of went viral in that group. Like everyone was just so excited, like, Oh, this is the best copy ever and blah, blah, blah. In hindsight, it wasn't, but, Anyways, um, so then what I did was I just followed up with each person that commented and said, hey, man, you know, I'm, I'm looking to break into this. Do you know anybody? And one person set me up with um, one of his old clients. And I harassed him for months, just like, let me do something for you. Let me work for you. Um, and he wrote, he got me to write like, I don't know, seven or 10 emails for $25 a piece, which is super cheap. Like, even when I was writing them, like, I had been trying for six years to break into this. And even when I was writing them, I was like, I don't want to do this. Like, this is horrendous, you know? Um, and so I just kind of broke in through that. And then he, he started, he was, he did a really good job at writing webinars and selling through webinars. And so I just started studying what he was doing. And then I, there was another opportunity with um, a company called the webinar agency. And I just jumped on that and that turned into a retainer. Um, and then I got another retainer and then I got another retainer. Um, but there's just nothing replicable. I mean, in the end of the day, what the truth in copywriting is that a lot of copywriters miss deadlines. They're not very good. Um, so when you go in there and you say, Hey, I'll do this for you to kind of trial my services and you hit the deadline and you don't turn in crap, uh, people are excited to hire you. So I guess that's the lesson. I don't know. I don't know what, I don't know how to explain how I've done what I've done. It's just been luck. I, I can't, oh, I don't believe that. <laughs> um, you, you, um, I can't even decide what my favorite thing is that you said, but I love that you threw something out there and looking back, you're like, that was such crap. Oh, yeah. because I think, I know I get stuck in this sometimes. You look at something and it's like, is it good enough? Is it good enough? Is it good enough? But you're never going to know it's good enough until you just do it. Right. So I love that you just did it. And I think also my big takeaway from that is, that you look back now and you're like, that's so crappy because you know so much more now. Mm -hmm. You were just like 10 steps ahead of everybody else. So it was amazing <laughs> to them. You know, I don't think you have to always be, I don't know. You've got to start at the bottom, I guess, because you just got to start. But yeah. I don't know. I just think that's so cool. Yeah. So, th I mean, that's a big thing. I, it, it, I mean, the copywriters that I do know are very... Um, a lot of them are very arrogant. Like the ones that are good are arrogant. And the reason is because <clears throat> they kind of hold the key to profit in a way, right? Like they're the magic makers. They're the ones that if you come and hire them, they'll, you know, they'll turn you into a millionaire sort of thing. And they kind of flaunt that around and they can treat people that are just getting started in a, in a negative light. But it's like they forget that that's where they're from. And I think that's maybe where um, I'm sort of humble and how I've come up is like, it's, it's just putting in the work and putting yourself out there. And, and the big thing is, you know, in copywriting and a lot of things is nobody trusts you on the, at the forefront, right? Like you have to be willing to do something to make them trust you. And so for me, it's re really just been, you know, offering my services at a discount to get in and prove myself. And then they go, oh, okay, yeah, let's, let's do this. Let's bring you in. Um, that's, really, that's really all I can think that's allowed me to get here. Um, I got a question for you only because, but I don't want it to come off sounding negative, if you know what I mean. Right. 
Um, so I know a lot of people get worried that they're going to have chargebacks or people are going to say that they don't value their service. Do you have problems with that? Because yours is one that even though you're making all the magic happen, it'd be really easy for a company to go, ah, it was just copyright. I mean, you know what I mean? Do you have that right. issue? Um, I've never had a chargeback, but I know that there have been people like copywriters that have, and I've seen some of their copy and I would be like, yeah, I would charge back on this too. Um, right now there's a, there's a, a lot of copywriters out there that are calling themselves copywriters that really shouldn't be because there's a lot of courses and mentorships and it's kind of like the, the business op du jour sort of thing right now, right? Like to become a copywriter and make six figures while you're writing on the beach. Um, and so that's created a lot of people that aren't very good. So in those cases, there's been chargebacks, um, for other people, I just haven't experienced it. So I don't know. I'd, I, like I said, I think as long as it doesn't suck and you hit your deadline and you're not horrible to work with, I'd, I'd be surprised to see a client go, Oh, you just put 60 hours into this project. I'm going to charge back every penny. You know, just, I don't think it's going to happen. You also just hit on something um, really b big and key too. I think you're right. There's such, there's such a persona that, well, I can just work from home or I can do this mm -hmm. glamorous job and I'm just going to throw something out there while I'm, you know, at Disneyland or whatever. And I, I, people don't necessarily show you the back end stuff. Yeah. What's a typical day for you look like? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really open about this. It's um, again, as someone who I really didn't like my job, like I really, really didn't like it at all. Um, and so I've dreamed about this for so long. And I think when you get to this level where you're working from home and you have, you know, I'm making more than I work than I ever did at the front desk. And um, you can forget how lucky you are that you don't have to go and do that. Like you have to remind yourself of how much it used to suck. Um, Cause really my day is I get up and then I just jump on the computer. And like, if I have a proper project, that can be like, if I write a webinar, I can be in for 60 hours. And that's not like 60 hours of sitting in front of a computer, that's 60 hours of like directly working. So if I'm in front of the computer for 80 hours and 20 hours of those I didn't work, I just wasted 20 hours, right? It's not, I think that's a big switch from like employee to a freelancer or business owner is like, when you're talking about those hours, you know, you're not just at a job getting paid for those hours doing whatever you do. Um, so my typical day is probably pretty scattered. I try and like get outside and walk around and, and um, you know, get some, get some energy, but it's super easy to get into these ruts where you just sit down and you're at your computer and that's all you do for a day, right? Um, so it's not as glamorous as a lot of these guys are making it, the people that are, I mean, one thing is sitting at the beach. Have you ever tried like looking at a laptop on a beach with the sun? You can't even see the laptop screen. So that whole premise is flawed right out the gate. Um, yeah. So what I try to do, I mean, my big thing is, I think the big thing is when you work from home, you have to separate all of your stuff from your free time. So I try and just keep like my phone and my computer and all that stuff in my office. And if I'm not in here, then I'm not using it. Like I'm present with my family because it's super easy to not be there mentally with your family when you're doing this sort of stuff. And that was the big thing that I found. And I still struggle with it. Like there's still going to be bouts, bouts of falling into those bad, bad habits. And I think that's another thing too, that you find with a lot of people when they come on and they say, Oh, I'm doing this. And I get up at six in the morning and I do all these things. And it's really easy to feel guilty from that, but they're giving you that snapshot of like that one or two week period where they're like doing everything perfect. Right. Um, I know that we all fall back into these bad ruts. Even the most positive people I know fall into these bad ruts. So. Yeah. So it's super important to protect your reputation. But I also know that when you start out, it's like you just want to find money wherever you're looking. How, right. picky, how picky are you with clients? I'm sure right now you are so super picky that it's, I mean, you're not going to take just anybody. It's, it, it's a big deal. But when right. you're starting out, should you be picky from the get go? Do you only, do you limit yourself to one type of client? Cause you're really good at knowing how to work with that type of client? Do you kind of get what I'm asking? Yeah. So there's a couple things to that. One is that um, it's, a, it's a weird thing that happens because when you're starting out, you get the lower level clients, right? And then when you get bigger, you get the bigger clients. But the problem is, is that the guy, like the low level clients are the ones where 
um, they need the most help. Like they need the most skill to make what they are doing work. Like I was saying, you know, as a copywriter, really what you want to be is you want to be the gasoline on a fire, right? Versus being the guy who's scrounging and helping him find kindling and like build the fire and, you know, set up all these different things to make it work. Um, so like my first client, they weren't a small company, like they were doing 4 million a year. Um, and they had the money just to test a guy out sort of thing, right? Like it wasn't any skin off their back to be, you know, here, write 10 emails for 25 bucks, like 200, 250 bucks to them was nothing, but it gives you that break, right? So it's like, okay, now I'm working for this reputable company that I can leverage their name alone. Even if I didn't get a result for them, I can leverage their name to kind of open new doors. Um, for niching, I think niching was really what kind of gave me my big break. So when I went in, I went in with the emails in the first, in the first case. And then I decided to focus on kind of being that webinar guy. Um, and I think that's what opened the door to the webinar agency because so many of, so many people applied for that job, right? He posted in a group of co uh, copywriters. So tons of people applied and I was the only one that got the job. But I was the only one that was, that could speak intelligent, intelligently about webinars, right? Um, so I think niching did help me in the early days for sure. So, but there's totally different schools of thought from all levels. Some people say would take whatever you can get. If you can get a sales letter, get a sales letter. If you can get a webinar, take that. If you can get an email, take that. It's just, it, it's totally up to preference and what you feel comfortable doing. That's really awesome advice. So I'm going to switch gears slightly on you. Okay. So that was more for if you want to be a copywriter, which you know, if, if you have, I'm guessing if you have a background in writing or something, that's a pretty easy, not an easy transition because it's a little bit different, but that's something they could totally do, which is awesome. But now I'm going to look at it from the standpoint of, um, I know people are going to be watching this that aren't necessarily copywriters, but now know they better get a copywriter as quickly as they can, which I understand that, um, depending on who you ask, you want to hire somebody different, you know, wherever you are. But I think copywriting is right up there with breathing. <laughs> right. But, um, which I don't think a lot of people realize <laughs> But um, so when you're looking for a good copywriter, you know, when you're starting out, you don't get to hire somebody like a James Wilder because they're kind of out of your league. Not right. kind of, they're way out of your league. <laughs> um, how, how do you find a good one? Cause it's like you said, they're kind of, it's almost one of those dime a dozen. Now I'm going to step on toes. It's kind of like the new catchphrase, like life coaches. Right. Um, everybody is a copywriter or everybody's a life coach. How do you know? Because you got to start somewhere. You know that there's good ones out there that are just starting that'll work for you. Mm -hmm. How do you find them? I'd probably say that referrals is the best way to go. Like tapping into your warm market because everybody has a good face value, right? Like that's, that's the magic of social media and you can portray whatever you want to portray. Um, like I know some people that are putting out some really good offers, like as copywriters and stuff, but I've seen their copy and I know that it's really not good. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's people that are undervaluing themselves, right? Like there's copywriters that are totally willing to work for way less than they should be. And if you can grab a person like that, then you're really lucky. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd either go referral or I would just look at learning it yourself, um, which I know sounds crazy. I think one of the biggest misconceptions about copywriting is that it's about writing and it's really not like there's a, I'm going to butcher the quote, but it's something like um, you don't write copy, you assemble it. And so really the best way to do it is that you just ask yourself lots of questions, like what's going through the prospect's mind and answer those questions and then just put them into your copy. Right? So, I mean, I know that's a super simplified version, but that's really all I'm doing. And I'm just, and you're just trying to frame it in a way that favorably represents your product or service. So I would, I would recommend learning it yourself, honestly. I'm not, like, I don't mean that you have to go and consume, like, you know, I'm reading about copywriting every single day. I'm not saying that you need to do that to get a successful campaign. But in the end of the day, I almost have the belief that a lot of product owners are um, more, more prone to write better copy because you're talking to your customers every day. Like that's where the magic is. Right. Um, I had a friend who, before he knew what copywriting was, he was marketing for, um, financial advisors, I believe. And he couldn't get the financial advisors results, but he could get financial advisors as clients really easily. And what he did was he would, he talked to hundreds of them on the phone and he wrote down everything they said in a binder. And then he took that and turned it in. He didn't even know he was turning it into copy. He just used those in his ads to acquire clients. 
but he was so accurate in describing all of their pains and desires because it was their words that it was super easy for them to go like, oh, this guy gets me. And they would, they would call him up. So he had no problem getting them as clients. And that's all copywriting is, right? So, yeah. That was a super big nugget. Because <laughs> that can be used anywhere. So where do you recommend if somebody wants to spend the time there? Um, do you do, because I'm sure with your campaigns, you do the same kind of stuff. Typically, how much time do you spend researching and talking to people? And how much time do you spend actually writing? Yeah, so... I don't even know what the time is, but I'd say like 90% of it is research, right? Because you are, you're, you've, you've listed out those questions. A lot of those questions become pretty standard in a lot of ways. I mean, they're going to change a little bit, um, but a lot of those questions are standard and you're just researching to find the, the answers to those questions. Um, and then once you actually, you get to a point as a copywriter, you get to a point where um, once you're kind of like brimming at the top of like, oh, I know what I'm, you're like, you're excited to write that's when you know you're ready to write. And that can take a long time. And I've found that I research way too much, which maybe isn't even good, but I have tons of research I don't even include. But it's so much easier just to, to really dig deep into the research and then just like plop it on the page instead of sitting there like, what am I going to write? What am I going to say? Um, you know, like a lot of people, John Carlton, who's like one of the top copywriters in the world, says, um, says that uh, writer's block isn't real. Um, it's just a, there's, it's just a lack of research, right? Cause there's plenty to say. So, um, yeah, I don't know what type of time I put into research, but it's the number one thing that I do. That's, that's what you're doing. That's what a copywriter is. They're researching and they're coming up with ideas and the ideas are found in the research. So everything is research and then assembling it on the page. That's really cool. So I actually have two questions that stem from that. The first one is, and by the way, you are so awesome to take time out of your day to do this. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, no worries. Um, so the first one is, so you've got something, you've done the research, you think it's good, you put it out and you get crickets. How do you know if it's copy or you just haven't done it long enough? Or, and then my second part of that is, because I keep seeing differing sides of the equation on this as I'm trying to learn more copyright, is... Um, do you write as a first person I, or do you write from a totally separate standpoint? Because I saw something the other day that they're like, you never use I, but I know some people are like, you tell it all, like it's your story. What right. do you find, what's your favorite way to do it? Um, okay, so what was your first question again? <laughs> first question was, I know, sorry. The first one was, um, how do you know if it's just that your copyright totally sucks? Oh, or okay. something else? Yeah. That comes down into the research again and looking at analytics. Um, like I've had, I had a campaign that we just couldn't crack and it was like, this doesn't make any sense. Why is this not working? Um, and so I, I just dug back into the research and we were just speaking to the person in a, a completely the wrong point in their kind of journey sort of thing, right? Which gets into like awareness levels and sophistication levels, which um, that's like, you could spend hours talking about that thing alone. Um, so yeah, again, it's just in the research and looking at the analytics. I mean, there's a lot of things. That's the big thing is like copy isn't the only thing that can make or break a campaign, right? I mean, it has a lot to do with your target market, um, the, the traffic that you're, you're running, all these sorts of different variables that can come into play, like especially the authority too, right? Um, like you hear, these, you hear these copywriters that come out and say like, oh, I made $3 million in seven days with this campaign but they don't tell you anything past that. So a lot of times that can be like the authority figure, like who is this guy? So if I came out and I offered a product on how to funnel hack and Russell Brunson came out with the same funnel or the same product, I mean, he's going to make a fortune because everybody knows who Russell Brunson is and I'm not even positioned as anybody in funnel hacking, right? So, I mean, there's all these different variables that go into it. So it's, it's just researching, kind of figuring out what's wrong with it. Um, and then your second question was... Do you, I've heard, I keep seeing something different on this. Some people say, just write, I, 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 you know, I was struggling with this. I was whatever. And then I read something the other day that's like, don't use I at all. It's almost like being back in English class where it's like, right. what am I supposed to put? <laughs> right. I think the thing is whenever you're, you can talk about yourself, but only if it's going to relate to a benefit to the reader, right? Like, so it should never be, I've heard that before. I've heard people be like, you have to talk about yourself so then they can see how awesome you are. 
but nobody cares about you, right? They only care about themselves. Um, so if you're saying that, you know, I ran uh, a campaign that made $300,000, you have to turn that then into a benefit to them if you're gonna talk about yourself, um, which is important. Like you have to frame why they should listen to you. And, you know, again, going back to the authority, um, but yeah, that's really the only time. I mean, if you're going through your copy and you're talking about yourself or there's too many eyes, um, that's definitely an editing thing to go through and be like, okay, how can I stop talking about myself and make this more about the reader? Do you find sometimes too that, now you're not the ad end of this, but does it take, I know I hear all the time, it's fortunes in the follow-up. Every time you follow up, do you throw back the same copy or are you constantly re editing it or changing it up just a little bit before you send it back out for a second, third, fourth time. Yeah. I mean, it's, everything is about angles, right? Like that's what, again, that's what people are paying copywriters for. Um, you know, kind of take it back. Like there's AI, you know, robots and stuff that can, that can replace a copywriter and they can write better. Um, that's a ways away. Cause really like once, once you get deeper into it, you realize again, that we're not writing, we're just coming up with ideas and different angles to attack a product from. So what I would probably do is, you know, you, we were, I was working for a company where we were writing three emails a day to the same list and just blasting them with the same offers. And all it was, was just coming up with a different idea. Like how do we capture their attention with this? Um, and so you, you take your avatar and you say, okay, um, what kind of fear play can we play on this, right? Like how can we tap into a fear? How can we tap into greed? And then you can almost, from each thing you can, you can lit, like bullet point them out. You can say fear, because we're either attracted to something or pain, or we want, we're attracted, sorry, we're attracted to um, greed and gain, or we're re retreating from pain. Um, and then you can bullet point those out and say like, okay, so what's, what type of pain are they trying to avoid? And you can list all those out. And then you can say, what, um, you know, what angle can you take to that your service would solve? Like what type of, how would your service solve that pain? Right. Or how would your service, um, give them what they want? And so you can, you can list out tons of angles like that. And that's literally all I do is I just take a Google doc. And I have one that says pain and one that says gain. And then I just list them all out. And then that's your, that's your angles that you can feed off of. You make this sound so easy. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it, it's so weird because you, you, it's super hard from the outside, right? It's really daunting, the whole thing. And then you kind of, you're, while you're doing it, you're like, oh man, this is, this is hard. I can't wrap my head around it. And then all of a sudden it just kind of like, it's a clearing and it opens and it goes like, oh, this is all I'm doing. Like, it's not, not that big of a deal sort of thing. And you can tell what an awesome pro James is. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I've got another question with that too, because, um, my dad always has a different opinion than me. So maybe this will end that debate. Just kidding, dad. Um, <laughs> so here's my question. Cause I know that there's differing schools on that too, is I'll see copies. Sometimes it's like pages and pages and pages and pages of, of copy, which incidentally funnels and everything are totally filled with copy and copies everywhere. Pa Facebook posts are copy, but yeah. you know, I'll see some of those that are just super crazy long. And I know my dad's always like the shorter, the better. You know what I mean? It's like, I just right. want to like two seconds, you know, a commercial. What is there like a magic number or is, you know, it does it totally depend on who your client is. I think that the, the real answer to that is that it should be as long as it needs to be. Right. Um, which is super ambiguous, but that's sort of, I mean, you can have, if you can make a sale in three sentences, then make a sale in three sentences. If it takes you 6,000 words or a two hour long webinar to make a sale, then, then do that. A lot of it I think comes down to, um, in ways it comes down to awareness levels. Like if somebody hasn't heard of internet marketing at all, and you sent them an email that has three sentences about it, like, okay, now buy here. That's not enough for that person who hasn't heard about internet marketing. But if you sent it to like somebody like you or I, it's completely different, right? Like maybe if those three sentences are powerful enough, they, they can sell us. Right. Um, so it's, it's really about kind of, that's why webinars are so powerful. So you're taking someone who is kind of on the fence. They're not ready to buy yet. And you're walking them through this long kind of sales story. That's going to convert them into a buyer they wouldn't have bought just from three sentences or from, you know, necessarily maybe just one page of copy. Um, but yeah, the answer to, 
I mean, that's another debate that people have is like long form versus short form. And um, it really depends. A lot of, with emails, a lot of the purpose of emails, like that short form copy is to sell the click. Like you're selling the click to get them to that bigger piece of copy, to get them to the sales letter or the webinar or the advertorial, right? So it all depends. That's a good answer, eh? <laughs> that is a good answer. <laughs> Everything depends. This is yeah. like English class, just kidding. You, know, you might differ with me on this one, but one of the most important thing I've noticed is headline. Because if you don't get that headline and that title right off, right at the bat, nobody's looking at you anyway. Um, and I know you were telling me that you actually have a little mini course that totally walks you through how to do a headline. Where can they find that, James? Yeah, so let me grab the link because it's, uh, it's just a bit.ly link that I set up. Awesome. So if you're watching this on YouTube, I'll put the link down below. If you're watching this on the podcast, I'll put it in the description because you're going to want to go get this. James is the best. He, um, he is so humble. <laughs> he talks about those, um, you know, the little hottie copywriters. James is not one of those. He is the nicest, most down to earth guy that ever was. Um, and I know you talked about learning this. Would you recommend a Udemy course? Would you recommend studying? you know, lots and lots of lots of copy. Where, where do you recommend to go to start? Cause it's so overwhelming on the outset, even though you make it sound so simple. Right. Um, it depends what you want to do. Like if you want to become a copywriter, then I would seriously suggest getting a mentor who can just tear apart your copy and make you feel horrible and learn what you did wrong. Um, that was the path that I took. That was for me, that was the best one, the kind of tough love approach. Um, if you just want to kind of learn how to write copy for yourself, what I would do is I'd just get a, I, would, I mean, the, the number one book that everyone recommends is Breakthrough Advertising, which is 125 bucks. Um, if you're willing to jump on that, that's a good idea. But if you don't, then, I mean, YouTube videos, there's the, the Gary Halbert letters, letters online, which are free. You can read those. Um, a lot of people have attributed that to being like their copywriting success. Um, and the, once, you, once you understand it, the big thing to do is just go and find sales letters and Facebook ads and all these things that are doing well. And you know, like a Facebook ad, you know, is performing well because you see it all the time, right? Nobody's going to keep running the same ad that's not making money. So if it's, if you see it all the time, then you know, they found the right angle, take that and break it down, like figure out what they're doing here. Are they handling an objection? Are they getting them excited about a massive, you know, gain that they could make in, in, in a week? Um, you know, break it down from that perspective and, that that's the number one education. Like that's what I still, I, again, since I don't always do what I say I'm doing, um, I try to break down a sales letter every week if you know, time permitting, and um, I have the willpower and discipline to do it that week. But yeah, so that's what I would do if I were getting started. Any last big word of advice, or you know, anything that I didn't even know enough to ask because I'm not a copywriter. Um, again just taking back to sort of how simple it is, <laughs> which I know doesn't sound good. Um, but th there's a great line, which again, I'm going to butcher is the person that can describe the prospects problems and pains to them better than they can themselves will automatically be assumed to have the solution. Um, so a great, you know, a quick, a quick kind of tidbit, cause I just happened to be reading this book that had a great line in it, which I don't know if you've ever had, um, have you ever cold called before, like cold called businesses before or anything? Oh yeah. yeah. Exactly. So it has this great intro about call reluctance and it says, you know, you're sitting in front of the phone and at 9 a.m. you go like, oh, I can't call them yet because they're just settling in. So that goes past. And then 10 a.m. you go like, oh, I can't call them because they're sitting down for meetings. Then the whole day has gone by and, you know, 3.30, you're like, oh, I can't call them. I'll get a fresh start tomorrow. Right. That is so accurate to what's going on in the prospect's mind when they're suffering, trying to get them to call. You automatically have to read on to go like, they obviously know how to solve this problem because they've experienced it, right? So copy isn't like this grandiose, crazy, um, like headlines and all these different things. It's just describing their pain so that they automatically believe that you have the solution to those problems. So that's my big takeaway. And that's what I've learned after the past couple of years and kind of having the epiphany of being like, oh, that's, that's how simple it really is. I think that's the hardest part um, is, you know, you're right. It, it is simple when you break it down to human emotion, but it's so hard when you're in the middle of it and you're going, oh, yeah. 
forget and you want to make, you know, all these big words and you want to use all these whatever. Yeah. I think I read somewhere you want it on a third grade level. Is that right? Or does that again, totally depend on your client? Yeah. It depends on your client. Like you'd be insulting. I think like you'd be insulting like a, a university professor if you're writing to him at a third level, but you do want to make it readable and easy to slip into, right? Like you don't want, the big thing is you don't want to have um, this kind of big word sticking out where it just kind of jars them out of that flow. Like you want it to be almost hypnotic if you can to kind of seep them in. Like if they're sitting down and watching a movie, right? I mean, they're not, hopefully the movie's good enough that their minds aren't racing in a different direction. So um, I would say that would be the, that'd be the big thing is just writing at a level that they, they, they stay hooked. You talked about how you don't want to put yourself up on this big pedestal because you, and you're right. It cannot be about you. If it's about you, nobody's buying, nobody cares. That's right. like one of my biggest pet peeve. Like you listen to people talk from stage and it's like, I don't care. Mm -hmm. I need to know. So how do you break that in a copy where you're still the authority and you still have the answer, but you're totally relating to them. Do you kind of get what I'm asking? Yeah. So just whatever, I mean, if you're talking about yourself, why is your story relevant, right? Like if you're selling to network marketers, um, you know, how is your story relevant to them? How is that, you know, if they, if you experience like, okay, I, you know, I, I couldn't work cause I had to pick up my three-year-old from school and I was racing over here and I just never had time to work on my network marketing business. That is a time that you can talk about yourself because that's a, a problem that they're probably facing themselves again. So that's, that's kind of describing their problem to them and be like, that's totally what I'm experiencing. And then presumably you have the solution to that problem, right? So those would be the times, or like I said before, like if you're, you know, I ran a campaign that made 300 K, um, you know, turn that around. Why does that benefit that? Was that a system that is applicable to them and can it get them the same results? Um, but just to sit there and be like, I did all these awesome things. Um, nobody cares. Right. So yeah, just always, how is it relating to the prospect? Which makes me think of one last question. And again, yep. thank you so much for your time. I know with funnels that they say like every single page it's, or every, not even every single page, every little section is a click here. You know, you want this click there, click here. Do you leave that into like a big copy when you're doing like a big ad or is it strictly at the end? I mean, how do you, how do you play it off so that it comes across and everything that you're writing, you know, you need this, you know, you need this. Right. To always have a call to action yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, in the end of the day, that's what the copy is doing. It's always mounting that tension to, to click, to drive that click or drive that call to action. Like if it's not a click, then it's to send me an email or it's to, um, do this or do that. Right. It's always a call to action. So like in Facebook posts, shoot me a message to get this webinar. Right. So it's not always just a click. But really what you're doing with copy is you're, you're mounting that tension, you're building that pain, like sounds a little bit evil, but you're twisting the knife, right? So you're you kind of an evil way to think about it is like you're stabbing them by stating the problem and then you're just agitating it, right? You're just twisting the knife back and forth and agitating it. And then you're giving them the relief with your solution, which is often the call to action. Um, and so that's really just how you structure it. Just always think of what, what do you want them to do? Like, that's what you're doing. You're reverse engineering. What do you want them to do? And then you're going back and going like, how do I get them to do that? Right. Um, so yeah, every, every stage in your funnel, pretty much anything that you put out should have a call to action. There seems to be a huge trend and I hate it, which is probably why I shy away from it because I hate it. Mm -hmm. is that Like people are just throwing up stuff all day long. You know, here's my shake. Bye. Here's my wrinkle cream. Bye. Here's my this right. that, or the other. Bye. And I hate it. And so I always really hesitate to put out, I'll do it every once in a blue moon, but my posts never end with buy now or click here or whatever. Cause I know I'm so turned off by it. Right. So is there a way around that? Or especially now this is purely mostly, you know, Facebook posts cause ads are totally different, you know, mm -hmm. monster, not monster. They're not a monster, but you know, a totally different thing. But how, how do you handle, or do you ever even deal with that end of copies, so to speak? What, what do you say to somebody that's, you know, their inclination is I want to sell. So every post has to be come by this or come by that or. Yeah. No, that's definitely not the right way to do it. I think what's happening is um, like on a grander scheme is that 
trust is consolidating, right? So people say like attend everything you read, which is, I actually just made this comment uh, yesterday is everything you read, like if you read an old copywriting book an old marketing book, um, you know, attention spans are shrinking, you know, it's super hard to get the prospects attention. And that's still the same argument today, right? That's always, so that's always been the case. And I think what's happening today is that it's more that um, trust is consolidating to the few that haven't burned them to make a quick sale, right? So it's, if you, if you really care about the person, like you're not, you're not in that me centric focus of like buy this product all the time and you're really trying to give value. Um, and then you put out a post and say, Hey, I think this is really going to benefit you. Then it's different, you know? So if it, if you've put out enough value that, okay, yeah, you can, you can just throw a sales message in front of me every once in a while. Um, then, then it's okay. But I think really what's happening now is that you're having to start to build audiences and create that trust first and then start to, and then start to sell. Um, and that's why I kind of uh, going back why like it's not all about like these big crazy headlines and all that sort of stuff because that's just to capture the attention of someone who isn't really focused on you you're trying to you know jar them out of their day um instead you know if you bring them in slowly into your circle of influence you don't need to be that crazy to get them to buy something right they, they already trust you and then you're just again talking to them about their problems and offering them solutions that is super awesome. Thank you so much. Because yeah, like I said, that's something that I just really totally. fast way to get me to unfriend you. <laughs> yeah, no, I know it, it's tough. And that, and I think that also goes back to network marketing is that um, why a lot of people don't succeed in it is because they're told to do things that they just don't feel comfortable with. So they're just not going to do it. And then, you know, and then there's these massive failure rates. I mean, that's, I've, I've a few buddies that make a lot of money in network marketing. And um, so I've been around it for a long time and I think, you know, and it gets a bad rap too, because you bring people in and it's this numbers game that people play where it's like, just do this. And, you know, and then for like the three freaks that are willing to do everything you say, um, they rise to the top and then you just go like, screw all of them. They didn't have it. They didn't have what it took. Right. And they can go back to their nine to five. They're not woke like us. Um, so I think that, um, I lost my, my train of thought with that one. Um, yeah, kind of giving people what they're comfortable with, with marketing and teaching them these, these real principles um, that everyone can get behind. Cause it's really hard if you take, um, you know, a secretary and then all of a sudden you say, okay, now you're going to be a salesperson, right? That's not going to click. Like they, they were never going to do that. And actually a great book um, kind of going off of copywriting here a little bit, but a great book is uh, Psycho Cybernetics. Have you read that or heard that? Yeah. I haven't even heard of it. I'm going to have no. to look at that. That is the greatest self-development uh, book ever because it's, it's written uh, it's like from the 50s or 60s. And what it does is it, it tells you to visualize to not manifest, but to change your self-image of who you are. And I think that's a big thing. Like if you say a, a secretary getting into, um, you know, MLM or something where they have to sell, they have to change their self image of who they are. Right. Um, so that's totally, if there's anything from this going by that book, that is the number one book. Everything else is a rip off. Everything else is a band aid. That's the best book there is. Oh my gosh. I love that. I cannot wait to go get it. Like for real. I yeah. think that especially with what we kind of talked about at the end, you know, like that was the book. When did you say it was 1950s? Something like that. Yeah. yeah those are the foundations. <laughs> I mean, that's like, and I know with marketing, you know, there's like the founders of marketing. And I know you were saying that with copyright too. It hasn't changed, but people are, there's people that are coming in that are trying to do something different and it's not working because, right. you know, which I also like, because um, even if, you know, heaven forbid, social media went away or whatever, those principles don't go away. You just change the vehicle. You just move and adapt with that skill. So mm -hmm. I think that's awesome that, you know, and, and you're right. You're totally building on foundations and principles that have been around for forever. Don't reinvent it. Just go copy it. Mm -hmm. So um, You're one that everybody better be following James Wilder. And um, he's probably way out of your league, but at some point <laughs> you can totally dream. And in the meantime, watch what he's doing. 
and what he's posting and how he's doing it because even though it is simple and you can do it there's really subtle ways and subtle little I was gonna say tricks it's not tricks but little nuances and he's been doing it for I know you've got a lot more years on it than I do <laughs> and um, I really appreciate you breaking this down so it's not like that mystical unicorn so to speak or that yeah exactly because it, it is easier than it sounds, but it's also a lot harder than it looks. So um, I really appreciate your time today. And again, no I'm going to put that link down below. Go check it out. Headlines, if you can't grab somebody's attention, it doesn't matter how good your copy is. So um, again, thanks so much. And with that, I guess it's a wrap. Thanks, James. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Are you tired of bugging your family and friends and bumping into the same people all over social media trying to pitch your opportunity? If so, grab your team members and go to www.marketingexplosion.org and pick up your free copy of MLM Momentum. It's going to teach you how to get people coming to you and applying for your opportunity. It's also going to teach you how to get paid for prospecting. See you soon.